Marley was dead to begin with, as dead as a doornail. Mind, I don't mean to say that I know of my own knowledge what there is particularly dead about a doornail. I might have been inclined myself to regard a coffin nail as the deadest piece of ironmongery in the trade. But the wisdom of our ancestors is in the simile, and my unhallowed hand shall not disturb it, or the country's done for. You will therefore permit me to repeat emphatically that Marley was as dead as a doornail. Scrooge and he were partners for I don't know how many years. Scrooge was his sole executor, his sole administrator, his sole assign, his sole residuary legatee, his sole friend and sole mourner. And even Scrooge was not so dreadfully cut up by the sad event, but that he was an excellent man of business on the very day of the funeral and solemnized it with an undoubted bargain. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire. Secret and self-contained and solitary as an oyster. The cold within him froze his old features, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, made his eyes red, his thin lips blue. Nobody ever stopped him in the street to say with gladsome looks, My dear Scrooge, how are you? When will you come to see me? No beggars implored him to bestow a trifle. No children asked him what it was o'clock. No man or woman ever once in all his life inquired the way to such and such a place of Scrooge. But what did Scrooge care? It was the very thing he liked. To edge his way along the crowded paths of life, warning all human sympathy to keep its distance. Once upon a time, of all the good days in the year on Christmas Eve, old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house. It was cold, bleak, biting weather. The city clocks had only just gone three, but it was quite dark already. It had not been light all day. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open that he might keep his eyes upon his clerk, who in a dismal little cell beyond, the sort of tank was copying letters. Scrooge had a very small fire, but the clerk's fire was so very much smaller that it looked like one coal. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Uncle! God save you! It was the voice of Scrooge's nephew who came upon him so quickly that this was the first intimation he had of his approach. Merry Christmas! Ah, humbug! Christmas a humbug, Uncle? You don't mean that, I am sure. I do. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry? What reason have you to be merry? You're poor enough. Come then, what right have you to be dismal? What reason have you to be morose? You're rich enough. Bah, humbug. Don't be cross, Uncle. What else can I be when I live in such a world of fools as this? Merry Christmas. Out on a Merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older but not an hour richer? If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. He should. Uncle. Nephew, keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it, but you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone, then. Much good may it do you. Much good has it ever done you. There are many things from which I might have derived good, by which I have not profited, I dare say. Christmas among the rest. I say, God bless it. Hear, hear. Let me hear another sound from you, Mr. Cratchit. You'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. You're a powerful speaker, sir. I wonder you don't get into Parliament. Oh, don't be angry, Uncle. Come, dine with us tomorrow. Yeah. But why, why? Why did you get married? Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love. Good afternoon. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why cannot we be friends? Good afternoon. I am sorry with all my heart to find you so resolute. But I have made the trial in homage to Christmas, and I'll keep my Christmas humor to the last. So a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. His nephew stopped at the outer Christmas door to bestow the greetings of the season on the clerk, who, cold as he was, was warmer than Scrooge. Happy Christmas, sir. There's another fellow, Cratchit, with 15 shillings a week, a wife and family talking about a merry Christmas. I'll retire to Bedlam. Gentlemen to see you, sir. Come in, come in. Scrooge and Marley, I believe. Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? 
Mr. Marley's been dead these seven years. He died seven years ago this very night. We have no doubt his liberality is well represented by his surviving partner. Yeah. At this festive season of the year, Mr. Scrooge, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comfort, sir. Are there no prisons? Plenty of prisons. And the union workhouses, are they still in operation? I'm very glad to hear it. Oh, I'm under the impression that they scarcely furnish prisons clear of mind or body to the multitude, a few of us are endeavouring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat to drink and means of warmth. We chose this time because it is a time of all others when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. What shall I put you down for? Nothing. I wish to be left alone, since you ask me what I wish, sir. That's my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the establishments I've mentioned. They cost me enough. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. They'd rather die. They'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Cheer of mind or body to the multitude. You want all day off tomorrow, I suppose? If quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient and it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used. I'll be bound. And you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. It's only once a year, sir. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. Well, I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier next morning. Yes, sir. Scrooge took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, and having read all the newspapers and beguiled the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went home to bed. He lived in chambers which had once belonged to his deceased partner. They were a gloomy suite of rooms in a louring pile of building up a yard and dreary enough for nobody lived in it but Scrooge, the other rooms being all let out as offices. The yard was so dark that even Scrooge, who knew its every stone, was fain to grope with his hands. Now. It is a fact that there was nothing at all particular about the knocker on the door, except that it was very large. It is also a fact that Scrooge had as little of what is called fancy about him as any man in the city of London. Then let any man explain to me, if he can, how it happened that Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw in the knocker, without its undergoing any intermediate process of change, not a knocker, but... <coughs> Marley's face. It was not angry or ferocious, but looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look, with ghostly spectacles turned up on its ghostly forehead. The hair was curiously stirred as if by breath or hot air, and though the eyes were wide open, they were perfectly motionless. Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon. It was a knocker again. To say that he was not startled, or that his blood was not conscious of the terrible sensation to which it had been a stranger since infancy, would be untrue. But he put his hand on the key he had relinquished, turned it sturdily, walked in, and lighted his candle. He fastened the door and walked across the hall and up the stairs, slowly to trimming his candle as he went. Darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked it. But before he shut his heavy door, he walked through the rooms to see that all was right. Quite satisfied, he put on his dressing gown and slippers and his nightcap and sat before the fire to take his gruel. It was a very low fire indeed, nothing on such a bit of night. The fireplace was an old one, built by some Dutch merchants long ago, and paved all round with quaint Dutch tiles designed to illustrate the scriptures. There were Cain's and Abel's, Pharaoh's daughters, hundreds of figures to attract his thoughts, and yet that face of Marley, seven years dead, came like the ancient prophet's rod and swallowed up the whole. <coughs>
Scrooge walked across the room. After several turns, he sat down again. As he threw his head back in the chair, his glance happened to rest upon a bell, a disused bell that hung in the room. It was with great astonishment and with a strange, inexplicable dread that as he looked, he saw the bell begin to swing. Every bell in the house was ringing. The bells ceased as they had begun. Then... Scrooge remembered to have heard that ghosts in haunted houses were described as dragging chains. The cellar door flew open, and then... It's all humbug. I don't believe it. It's humbug still. I don't believe it. The same face. The very same. Marley in his pigtail, usual waistcoat, tights and boots. The chain he drew was clasped about his middle. It was long and wound about him like a tail, and it was made for Scrooge observed it closely of cash boxes, keys, padlocks, ledgers, deeds, and heavy purses wrought in steel. His body was transparent so that Scrooge observing him and looking through his waistcoat could see the two buttons on his coat behind. Now, now, what do you want with me? Much. Why? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? You're particular for a shade? In my life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Can you sit down? I can. Do it then. You don't believe me. I don't. Why? Do you doubt your senses? Because a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheat. You may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of underdone potato. There's more of gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. Humbug, I tell you. Humbug! <sighs> ah, mercy, mercy, mercy. Get for apparition. Why? Why do you trouble me? Man of wealth am I? Do you believe in me or not? I do. I must. But why do spirits walk the earth and why do they come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far. It is condemned to do so after death. It is doomed to wander through the world. Jacob. Well, I will, but don't be hard on me. Don't be flowery, Jacob. Pray.
surrender me, thank you. Well, I think I, I think I'd rather not. Couldn't I take them all at once and have it over, Jacob? wide open. Scrooge became sensible of confused noises in the air. The spectre, after listening for a moment, joined in the mournful dirge and floated out upon the black dark night. Scrooge followed to the window, desperate in his curiosity. He looked out. The air was filled with phantoms wandering hither and thither in restless haste and moaning as they went. Every one of them wore chains, like Marley's ghost. One old ghost, in a white waistcoat, had a monstrous iron safe attached to its ankle and cried piteously at being unable to assist a wretched woman with an infant below upon a doorstep. I know that fellow, but I remember. Yes, yes, but I, I know it. I know it. The misery with them all was clearly that they sought to interfere for good in human matters and had lost the power forever. too when I went to bed. I think possible that I could have slept through a whole day and far into another night. It isn't possible that anything's happened to the sun and this is twelve at noon. The idea being an alarming one, he scrambled out of bed and groped his way to the window. All that he could make out was that it was still very foggy and extremely cold and that there was no noise of people running to and fro and making a great stir, as there unquestionably would have been if night had beaten off bright day and taken possession of the world. Scrooge went to bed again and thought and thought and thought it over and over and could make nothing of it until he remembered on a sudden that the ghost had warned him of a visitation when the bell tolled one. He resolved to stay awake until the hour was past. The hour itself and nothing else. Scrooge, starting up into a half-recumbent attitude, found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor, who drew near as close to it as I am now to you. And I am standing in the spirit at your elbow. Are you the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold to you? I am. It was a strange figure, like a child. Yet not so like a child as like an old man, diminished to a child's proportions. Who and what are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No, your past. Rise and walk with me. The grasp, though gentle as a woman's hand, was not to be resisted. He rose, but finding that the spirit made towards the window, clasped his robe in supplication. I am a mortal and liable to fall. The spirit laid his hand upon his heart. Bear but a touch of my hand there, and you shall be upheld in more than this. 
As the words were spoken, they passed through the wall and stood upon an open country road with fields on either hand. Good heaven! I was bred in this place. I was a boy here. He was conscious of a thousand odors floating in the air, each one connected with a thousand thoughts and hopes and joys and cares, long, long forgotten. Your lip is trembling. And what is that upon your cheek? Oh, no, nonsense, nonsense. It's a raindrop. Lead on. Lead. Lead on. Do you recollect the way? I could walk it blindfold. Some shaggy ponies now were seen trotting towards him with boys upon their backs who called to other boys in country gigs and carts driven by farmers. All these boys were in great spirits and shouted to each other until the broad fields were so full of merry music and the crisp air laughed to hear it. These are but shadows of the things that have been. They have no consciousness of us. Scrooge knew them, every one. Why was he filled with gladness when he heard them give each other Merry Christmas as they parted at crossroads and byways for their several homes? What was Merry Christmas to Scrooge? Out upon Merry Christmas, what good had it ever done to him? The school is not quite deserted. A solitary child, neglected by his friends, is left there still. I know. I know. They were now in the busy thoroughfare of a city. It was made plain by the dressing of the shops that here, too, it was Christmas time again. But it was evening and the streets were lighted up. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door. Do you know this place? Know it? Why, I was apprenticed here. Why, it's old Fezziwig, bless his heart. Is Fezziwig alive again? Yo, ho there, Ebenezer Dick! <laughs> Scrooge's former self, now grown a young man, came briskly in, accompanied by his fellow apprentice. Dick Wilkins, to be sure, bless me, yes, there he is. Oh, he's very much attached to me, was Dick. Poor Dick, oh, dear, dear. Yo, ho there, boys, no more work tonight. Christmas evening! Christmas evening! Let's have the shutters up, eh? You wouldn't believe how those two fellows went at it. They charged into the street with the shutters. One, two, three, had them up in their places. Four, five, six, barbed them, pinned them. Seven, eight, nine, and came back before you could have got to twelve. Panting like racehorses. Clear away, there was nothing they wouldn't have cleared away. Or couldn't have cleared away with old Fezziwig looking on. <laughs> In came all the young men and women employed in the business. In came the housemaid with her cousin, the baker. In came the cook with her brother's particular friend, the milkman. In they all came, one after another, some shyly, some boldly, some gracefully, some awkwardly, some pushing, some pulling. In they all came anyhow and everyhow. Away they all went, twenty couples at once, hands half round and back again the other way, down the middle and up again, round and round in various stages of affectionate grouping. Old top couple always turning up in the wrong place, new top couple starting off again as soon as they got there. All top couples at last, and not a bottom one to help them. Oh, look at Fezziwig. Look at him there. Oh, isn't he wonderful? Oh, how he dances. No one's better than he. Oh, isn't he glorious? Look at old Fezziwig, just as he was. Oh, I remember him so. And Mrs. Fezziwig, too. Oh, oh, oh. oh, what a lovely party. There were more dances, and there were forfeits, and more dances, and there was cake, and there was negus, and there was a great piece of cold roast, and there was a great piece of cold boiled, and there were mince pies, and plenty of beer. When the clock struck eleven, this domestic ball broke up. Oh, dear, 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 dear. A small matter to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. Small. He spent but a few pounds of your mortal money. Three or four pounds. Oh, no, it isn't that, it isn't that spirit. The happiness is just as great as if it cost a fortune. It's, it's, it's... What's the matter? Mm, nothing particular. Something, I think. No, 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 it's just that I'd like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now. That's all. His former self turned down the lamps 
as he gave utterance to the wish, and again Scrooge saw himself. He was older now, a man in the prime of his life. His face had not the harsh and rigid lines of later years, but it had begun to wear the signs of care and avarice. He was not alone, but sat by the side of a fair young girl in a morning dress, in whose eyes there were tears, which sparkled in the light that shone out of the ghost of Christmas past. It matters little to you, very little. Another idol has displaced me, and if it can cheer and comfort you in the time to come, as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. What idol has displaced you? A golden one. Oh, I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion drains. Have I not? What then? Even if I have grown so much wiser, what then? I'm not changed towards you, am I? Your own feelings tell you that you were not what you are. I am. That which promised happiness when we were one in heart is fraught with misery now. How often, how keenly I have thought of this, I will not say. It is enough that I have thought of it. Have I ever sought relief? In words? No, never. In what, then? In a changed nature. In an altered spirit. In another atmosphere of life. Another hope as its great end. Bell. In everything that made my love of any worth or value in your sight. And I release you. Oh, no. With a full heart for the love of him you once were. May you be happy in the life you have chosen. Spirit, show me no more. Conduct me home. Why do you delight to torture me? One shadow more. No more, no more. I don't wish to see it. Show me no more. But the relentless ghost pinioned him in both his arms and forced him to observe what happened next. They were in another scene and place, a room not very large or handsome, but full of comfort. Near to the fire sat a beautiful young girl, so like that last that Scrooge believed it was the same until he saw her, now a comely matron, sitting opposite her daughter. And now Scrooge looked more attentively than ever when the master of the house, having his daughter leaning fondly on him, sat down with her and her mother at his own fireside. And when he thought that such another creature, quite as graceful and full of promise, might have called him father, and been a springtime in the haggard winter of his life. His sight grew very dim, indeed. Well, I saw an old friend of yours this afternoon. Who was it? Guess. Oh, how can I? Oh, I don't know. Mr. Scrooge. Mr. Scrooge it was. Oh. I passed his office window, and as it was not shut up and he had a candle in sight, I could scarcely help seeing him. <laughs> his partner lies upon the point of death no. here. No, no. And there he sat alone. No. Quite alone in all the world. No, no, spirit, spirit, remove me from this place. I told you that these were the shadows of things that have been, that they are what they are. Do not blame me. Remove me, remove me, I cannot bear it. He turned upon the ghost, and seeing that it looked upon him with a face in which in some strange way there were fragments no. of all the faces it had shown him. No, no, leave me. Wrestled with it. Leave me, leave me, take, take me back. Scrooge pressed down with all his force. Take me back, haunt me, haunt me, haunt me no longer. But he couldn't hide the light which streamed from under it. No, 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 on me, no, no, Waking and sitting up in bed to get his thoughts together, Scrooge had no occasion to be told that the bell was again on the stroke of one. Finding that he turned uncomfortably cold when he began to wonder which of his curtains this new spectre would draw back, he put them every one aside with his own hands and lying down again, established a sharp lookout all round the bed. He was ready for a good, broad field of strange appearances, and nothing between a baby and a rhinoceros would have astonished him very much. 
A blaze of ruddy light streamed upon his bed, more alarming than a dozen ghosts, as he was powerless to make out what it meant or would be at. At last he began to think that the source and secret of this ghostly light might be in the adjoining room, from whence it seemed to shine. He got up softly and shuffled in his slippers to the door. Come in, Ebenezer Scrooge. It was his own room. There was no doubt about that. But it had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceilings were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove. Heaped upon the floor to form a kind of throne were turkeys, geese, game, sucking pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, cherry-cheeked apples, immense twelfth cakes, and seething bowls of punch that made the chamber dim with their delicious steam. In easy state, upon this couch, there sat a jolly giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch in shape not unlike Plenty's horn, and held it up, high up, to shed its light on Scrooge, as he came peeping round the door. Come in, come in, <laughs> and know me better, man. I am the ghost of Christmas present. <laughs> Scrooge hung his head before the spirit. He was not the dogged Scrooge he had been, and though the spirit's eyes were clear and kind, he did not like to meet them. <laughs> Look upon me. <laughs> you have never seen the like of me before. <laughs> never. But spirit, conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion, and I learned a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. <laughs> Touch my robe. Scrooge did as he was told and held it fast. All vanished instantly. The room, the fire, the ruddy glow, the hour of night, and they stood in the city streets on Christmas morning. And perhaps it was the pleasure the good spirit had in showing off this power of his, or else it was his kind, generous, hearty nature and his sympathy with all poor men that led him straight to Scrooge's clerks. For there he went and took Scrooge with him, holding onto his robe, and on the threshold of Bob Cratchit's door, the spirit smiled. What has ever got your precious father, then? And your brother, Tiny Tim. And Martha Wanders late last Christmas Day by half an hour. Yes, Ma. Here's Martha, Mother. Hurrah! Oh, I bless your heart alive, my dear. How late you are. You had a deal of work to finish up last night. Mm, well, sit you down before the fire, mm. my dear, and have a warm, Lord bless you. No, no, there's Father coming. Oh, hide, Martha, hide. Oh, but where? So Martha hid herself. And in came little Bob, the father, and Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Hello. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. Alas for Tiny Tim. Oh, he bore a little me. crutch and had his limbs supported <laughs> by an iron frame. Why, where's our Martha? Not coming. Not coming? Not coming on Christmas Day? Here I am. <laughs> <laughs> How did little Tim behave? As good as gold. Somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much thinks the strangest things you ever heard. He told me, coming home, that he hoped the people saw him in the church because he was a cripple, and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Ah, the punch. A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. God, God bless, bless us. God bless us, everyone. Now come, sit you down at the table. He sat very close by his father's side on his little stool. Bob held his little withered hand in his, as if he loved the child and wished to keep him by his side. Spirit, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat in the poor chimney corner and the crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No. Oh, no, oh, no, kind spirit. Say, he will be spared. If he be like to die, he had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Oh, 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 dear. Man, oh, dear. if man you be in heart, forbear that wicked cant until you have discovered what that surplus is and where it is. 
Mr. Scrooge. I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. Founder of the feast, indeed. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast on, and I hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, the children. Christmas Day. Ah, I'll drink his health for your sake and the days, not for his. Long life to him, a merry Christmas and a happy new year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. <laughs> well, to Mr. Scrooge. To Mr. Mr. Scrooge. Scrooge. Mr. Scrooge. <laughs> Scrooge and the spirit went along the streets, and the brightness of the roaring fires in parlours and all sorts of rooms was wonderful. Blessings on it, how the ghost exulted, how it bared its breadth of breast and opened its capacious palm and floated on, outpouring with a generous hand its bright and harmless mirth on everyone within its reach. <laughs> Scrooge recognised his own nephew's laugh and found himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room with the spirit standing, smiling by his side and looking at the same nephew with approving affability. If you should happen by any unlikely chance to know a man more best in a laugh than Scrooge's nephew, all I can say is I should like to know him too. Introduce me to him and I'll cultivate his acquaintance. I said Christmas was, was a humbug, and as I lived, he believed it too. Oh, more shame on him, Fred. Oh, he's a comical old fellow, that's the truth, and not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offences carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. Oh, well, I'm sure he's very rich, Fred. At least you always tell me so. What of that, my dear? His wealth is of no use to him. He doesn't do any good with it. He doesn't make himself comfortable with it. Oh, I have no patience with him. Oh, oh I have. I'm sorry for him. I couldn't be angry with him if I tried. Here, he takes it into his head to dislike us, and he won't come and dine with us. What's the consequence? That he loses some pleasant moments that could do him no harm. Mm. I mean to give him the same chance every year, whether he likes it or not, for I pity him. He may rail at Christmas till he dies, but he can't help thinking better of it. I defy him if he finds me going there in good temper year after year and saying, Uncle Scrooge, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he's given us plenty of merriment, I'm sure. And we'll be ungrateful not to drink his health. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to the man, whatever he is. He wouldn't take it from me, but he may have it, nevertheless. Uncle Scrooge! <laughs> well, Uncle Scrooge. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Scrooge, eh? Uncle Scrooge, eh? <laughs> Uncle Scrooge had imperceptibly become so gay and light of heart that he would have pledged the unconscious company in return and thanked them in an inaudible speech if the ghost had given him time. But the whole scene passed off in the breath of the last word spoken by his nephew, and he and the spirit were again on their travels. Much they saw, and far they went, and many homes they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirit left his blessing and taught Scrooge his precepts. It was a long night. If it were only a night, but Scrooge had his doubts of this because the ghost grew older, clearly older. Scrooge had observed this change, but never spoke of it until looking at the spirit as they stood together in an open place, he noticed that its hair was grey. Our spirit's life so short. My life upon this globe is very brief. It ends tonight. Tonight? Tonight at midnight. The time is drawing near. Look, here. Ah, what, what are these? From the folds of its robe, it brought two children, wretched, abject, frightful, hideous, miserable. They knelt down at its feet and clung upon the outside of its garment. Oh, man, look here. Look, look down here. Ah, me. They were a boy and girl, yellow, meager, ragged, scowling, wolfish, but prostrate too in their humility. Where graceful youth should have filled their features out and touched them with its freshest tints, a stale and shriveled hand like that of age had pinched and twisted them. Spirit, are they yours? They are man's, and they cling to me, appealing from their fathers. This boy is ignorance. This girl is one. Beware them both, but most of all, beware this boy. 
I see that written which is due, unless the writing be erased. Deny it. Slander those who tell you it must be. Have they no refuge or resource? Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? Scrooge looked about him for the ghost and saw it not. He remembered the prediction of old Jacob Marley and lifting up his eyes beheld a solemn phantom draped and hooded coming like a mist along the ground towards him. The phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached. When it came near him, Scrooge bent down upon his knee, for the very air through which this spirit moved seemed to scatter gloom and mystery. It was shrouded in a deep black garment which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched hand. I am in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. You are about to show me the shadows of things that have not yet happened, but will happen in the time before us. Is that so, spirit? Ghost of the future, I fear you more than any spectre I have seen. As I know your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, I am prepared to bear you company and do it with a thankful heart. Will you not speak to me? It gave him no reply. The hand was pointed straight before them. Lead on, lead on. The night is waiting fast. It is precious time to me, I know. Lead on. Spirit. The phantom moved away as it had come towards him. Scrooge followed in the shadow of its dress, which bore him up, he thought, and carried him along. The city seemed to spring up about them, and there they were, in the heart of it. The spirit stopped beside one little knot of businessmen. Oh, I don't know much about it either way. I don't know, he's dead. When did he die? Last night, I believe. Why, what was the matter with him? I thought he'd never die. God knows. What's he done with his money? He hasn't left it to me, that's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's likely to be a very cheap funeral. For upon my life, I don't know anybody who will go to it. Suppose we make up a party and volunteer. I don't mind going if a lunch is provided. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm the most disinterested among you after all. Mm -hmm. For I never wear black gloves and I never eat lunch. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll offer to go if anyone else will. I come to think of it, I'm not at all sure that I wasn't his most particular friend. For we used to stop and speak whenever we met. Scrooge knew the men and looked towards the spirit for an explanation. The phantom glided into a street. Its finger pointed at two persons meeting. How are you? Are you? Well, old Scratch has got his own at last, eh? Yes, I'm told. Cold, isn't it? Seasonable, but Christmas. Yeah. You're not a skater, I suppose. Yeah, no, no. Oh, well. well. Good morning. Good morning. Spirit, I see. I see. <laughs> Mercy for heaven. What is this? He recoiled in terror, for the scene had changed. And now he almost touched a bed, a bare, uncurtained bed, on which beneath a ragged sheet there lay a something covered up which, though it was done, announced itself in awful language. Scrooge glanced towards the phantom. Its steady hand pointed towards the head. The cover was so carelessly adjusted that the slightest raising of it, the motion of a finger on Scrooge's part, would have disclosed the face. Spirit, this is a fearful place. In leaving it, I shall not leave its lesson. Trust me. Let us go. Still the ghost pointed with an unmoved finger to the head. 
I understand you and I would do it if I could, but I have not the power, spirit. I have not the power. Again, it seemed to look upon him. Spirit, I beseech you, let me see some tenderness connected with a death, or this dark chamber will be forever present to me. The phantom spread its dark robe before him for a moment like a wing, and withdrawing it revealed a room in poor Bob Cratchit's house. My little child. Don't mind it, Father. Don't be grieved. Sunday. You went today then, Robert? Yes, my dear. I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to see how green a place it is. But you'll see it often. I promised him that I would walk there on a Sunday. My little, little child. My little child. I'm sure we shall none of us forget poor Tiny Tim, shall we? Or this first parting there was among us. Then I am very happy. I am very happy. Oh, oh, oh dear. Spectre, something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. I know it, but I know not how. Tell me what man that was whom we saw lying dead. A churchyard. Here then, the wretched man whose name he had now to learn lay underneath the ground. It was a worthy place, walled in by houses, overrun by grass and weeds. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one. Answer me one question before I draw near to that stone spirit. Are these the shadows of things that will be or the shadows of things that may be only? Still the ghost pointed downward to the grave by which it stood. Oh. Spirit, no, 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 spirit. Man's courses will foreshadow certain ends to which if persevered in they must lead. But if the courses be departed from, the ends will change. Say, it is thus with what you show me. The spirit was as immovable as ever. Scrooge crept towards it trembling as he went, and following the finger read upon the stone of the neglected grave... Ebenezer Scrooge! No! No, spirit, oh, no, no, spirit, hear me! I'm not the man I was. I'll not be the man I have been. Why, show me this if I am past all hope. Good spirit, your nature intercedes for me and pities me. I will honor Christmas in my heart. I'll try to keep it all the year. I'll live in the past and the present and the future. Oh, tell me that I may sponge away the writing on this stone. In his agony, he caught the spectral hand. No. It sought to free itself, but he was strong in his entreaty and detained it. But the spirit stronger no, no. repulsed him. Then, holding up his hands in a last prayer to have his fate reversed, he saw an alteration in the phantom's head and dress. It shrunk, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost. Yes, the bedpost was his own. The bed was his own. The room was his own. I'm at home. Best and happiest of all, the time before him was his own to make amends. Oh, Jacob Marley, heaven and Christmas, time be praised for this. I say it on my knees, oh, Jacob, on my knees. Here, here. I am here. The shadows of the things that would have been may be dispelled. They will be. I know they will. Oh, oh, oh. oh I, 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 I don't know what to do. <laughs> I'm, I'm as light as a feather. <laughs> I'm as happy as an angel, as merry as a schoolboy, <laughs> as giddy as a drunken man. A merry, a merry, a merry Christmas to everybody. A happy New Year to all the world. <laughs> Running to the window, he opened it and put out his hand. Oh, glorious, glorious. I don't know what day of the month it is. <laughs> I don't know how, 
How long I've been among the spirits. I don't know anything. I'm quite a baby. All over my life, I don't care. I'd rather be a baby. Hello. Whoop, whoop. Hello, hello, hello there. What? What's today? Eh? What's today, my fine fellow? Today? Why, Christmas Day. It's Christmas Day. I haven't missed it. The spirits have done it all in one night. Oh, they can do anything they like. Of course they can. Of course they can. Hello, my fine fellow. Hello? Do you know the polterers in the next street but one? I should hope I did. Oh, very intelligent boy. A most remarkable boy. Do you know whether they've sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there, the big one? What, the one as big as me? <laughs> what a delightful boy. It's a pleasure to talk to him. Yes, my buck. It's hanging up there now. He said, well, go and buy it. Go and buy it and tell him to bring it here, that I may give him directions where to take it. Come back with the man in less than five minutes and I'll give you a half a crown. All right, sir. Oh, I, I'll send it to Bob Cratchit. He shan't know who sends it. It's, 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 twice, it's twice the size of Tiny Tim. The chuckle with which he said this, and the chuckle with which he paid for the turkey, and the chuckle with which he paid for the cab, and the chuckle with which he recompensed the boy, were only to be exceeded by the chuckle with which he sat down breathless in his chair again and chuckled till he cried. He dressed himself all in his best, and at last got out into the streets. The people were by this time pouring forth, as he had seen them with the ghost of Christmas present. And walking with his hands behind him, Scrooge regarded every one of them with a delighted smile. Merry Christmas, madam. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, too, sir. Merry Christmas. Oh, Merry Christmas, my good man. Oh, oh, nice to see you, my dear sir. May, 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 may I wish you a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you, sir. Oh, oh, happy Christmas, my boy. Happy Merry Christmas, darling. Merry Christmas. Ah, same to you, same to you, same to all of you. Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas. <laughs> He went to church and walked about the streets and watched the people hurrying to and fro and patted children on the head and questioned beggars and looked down into the kitchens of houses and up to the windows and found that everything could yield him pleasure. In the afternoon, he turned his steps towards his nephew's house. Fred. Oh, bless my soul. Who's there? Well, it's I, your Uncle Scrooge. <laughs> I've, I've come to dinner. Will you... Will you let me in, Fred? Come in, come in, Uncle Scrooge. Look who's here, everyone. Let him in. It's a mercy he didn't shake his arm off. He was at home in five minutes. Nothing could be heartier. Wonderful party, wonderful games, wonderful unanimity, wonderful happiness. But he was early at the office next morning. Oh, he was early there. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late, that was the thing he'd set his heart on. The clock struck nine, no Bob. A quarter past, no Bob. He was full 18 minutes and a half behind his time. Hello. What do you mean by coming here at this time of the day? I'm sorry, sir. I am behind my time. You are. Yes, I think you are. Step this way, sir, if you please. It's only once a year, sir. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. Now, I'll tell you what, my friend. I'm not going to stand this sort of thing any longer. I'm sorry, sir. <laughs> and therefore, I'm about to raise your salary. Sir? A merrier Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, than I've given you for many a year. I'll raise your salary, and I'll endeavor to assist your struggling family, and we'll discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop. Bob, make up the fires, and bring another scuttleful of coal before you dot another I. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all, and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend 
as good a master and as good a man as the good old city knew or any other good old city, town or borough in the good old world. He had no further intercourse with spirits, but he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. And may that be truly said of us and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, every one.